Uh, today's topic is uh, mind over circumstances, which in a way is a continuation of what I spoke uh, uh, two or three sessions back on being God conscious. So often Christians are problem conscious, devil conscious, people conscious, and uh, uh, self-conscious. Whereas they're called to be God conscious all the time. And being God conscious also means having in mind the things of God which he puts in our minds. For example, when uh, Peter told Jesus, never Lord, this shall never happen to you. In the context of Jesus saying, you're going to go to Jerusalem, going to be arrested and crucified. And Peter says, no, this should not happen to you. And the Lord tells him in response, Matthew 16, 23, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Worldly thinking, not godly thinking. When you have in mind the things of God, in other words, what God has spoken to us, what God has done to us in our lives, it's very important that from our past we remember his blessings. We count his blessings. Forget not his benefits, the psalmist writes in Psalm 103 verse 2. In the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 3, to the church in Sardis, it's written, Remember what you received and heard. Obey it and repent. So what we hear from God, what we what God done for, we call to keep in mind. And also keep in mind what God speaks to us about the future, about the present. So we need to have in mind the things of God. Now, one of the problems that most Christians have is we're not concerned about what we think. We're very careful about what we do. We're very careful about what we say. Because what we say, people can hear. What we do, people can see. We're not concerned about our thinking. God examines our thinking. In Psalm 94, verse 11 is written, For God knows the thoughts of man. He knows they are futile. And the Lord, through Spirit, according to God's word, has given us a sound mind. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God did not give the spirit of timidity, but of power, love, and sound mind. A clear mind. When you have a sound mind, he gives us thoughts he puts in our minds. And we keep it in our minds and don't let the mind go away from those. Then we rise about difficult circumstances. In the world, we have difficult circumstances. We have difficulties. We have suffering. The more we choose to serve God, the more we'll have problems. Second Timothy 3.12 says, If anyone chooses to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, he will be persecuted. Of course, this word persecution is too big a word uh, personally for me to apply in my life. I can't say I'm persecuted. But we all have difficulties. It's part of our calling. Philippians 1.29 We're going to not only believe upon him, but also to suffer for him. And as we go through trials, it's important not to keep our mind on the problems we are facing right now. Rather, what God speaks to us in those circumstances. We have been given the Holy Spirit who is a counselor. Who is a counselor. And when you have a walk with the Holy Spirit each and every day, walk in step with the Spirit, he will take from Jesus and make known to us. In John 16, 14, Jesus says about the Holy Spirit, he will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making known to you. So he will reveal to us and you can be sure when difficulties are there, he will surely speak to you. He loves to comfort those who are brokenhearted. He comforts us in all our troubles. And the Holy Spirit is basically, his nature is to comfort. He is referred to as parakletos in John 14, 16. Parakletos means encourager. He is an encourager. So independent of circumstances, we can rise above the circumstances when the Holy Spirit speaks to us. And our minds are focused on that. We retain that. We retain that. You know, you look at the parable of the sower. The sower uh, sowed seed and the Lord spoke about different kinds of 
places where the seed fell, some along the path, some in rocky places, some among thorns, some on fertile soil or good soil. Pouring on fertile soil refers to the soil refers to, according to Luke 8.15, people of the noble and good heart who hear the word of God, retain it, and with perseverance produce crop 30, 60, 100 fold. Hear it, retain it, don't, it, don't let it go away, and through perseverance. Perseverance is only required when you have difficulties. When everything is fine, you don't need perseverance. Perseverance also means endurance. In Greek, it's a word called homonone, homonone. And it means to persevere, to go through trials and face them joyfully, enduring hardships. That will happen when we hear the word, written it through persons, produce crop 30, 60, 100 fold. So today we're going to look at the aspect of our thinking in times of difficulties, in difficult circumstances. I'll talk about present circumstances, future circumstances, and also our thinking in response to what people say about us or do to us. So three different scenarios. First is difficult circumstances. Now, the Holy Spirit not only speaks to our hearts, he speaks to our minds. He puts thoughts in our minds. There's a very beautiful story in the Bible about how David, actually David wanted to build a temple in Jerusalem. God told him, you won't build a temple. And God made him the architect. God is so gracious. David had this passion to build a temple. But God told him, you will not build a temple. Your son Solomon will build a temple. But God gave him a consolation prize. He made him the architect. And if you look at 1 Chronicles 28, chapter, verse 12, read about how David gave Solomon all the plans the Spirit had put in his mind for the temple course, for treasuries, the surrounding rooms. The architecture of the temple is put in the mind of David by the Holy Spirit. And David gave those plans to Solomon for him to build the temple. So God puts his word, his thoughts in our, in our minds. He puts the thoughts and he speaks to our hearts. The Old Testament is prophesied by Jeremiah. But God says to Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31, 33, I'll put my law in their minds and write it in their hearts. Today, law is replaced by the teachings of Jesus. Not replaced, qualified. Qualified by teachings of Jesus. And uh, they always bless us. Word of God always blesses us. And today, Lord is in the, uh, uh, in the business of writing his word in our hearts and minds. That's his work in our lives. One of the works of Holy Spirit in our life. So as we learn to live by the Spirit, which also means living by uh, the word of God, that's the Holy Spirit speaks to us. In difficult circumstances, surely he will speak to us. He is a God of all comfort. And by keeping in mind what God speaks to us in difficult circumstances, we will rise above difficult circumstances. In Romans 5.17, Paul writes, If by the trespass of one man, death reigns through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness Reign in life through one man, Christ Jesus. What a powerful verse it is. All of, all of scripture is powerful, but this is a lot of relevance to people who look at the problem and say, oh, look at things happening. Terrible things are happening in the world. Things are happening. Ukraine, Russia war, Israel, Hamas war. Terrible things are happening. What, where is the world heading to? It's heading towards chaos. Yes. Last days, we can will increase, but grace abounds. And all these problems are basically because of the problem of sin, long time ago in the Garden of Eden. Death is reigning in the world. Why? To trespass of one man. If there one man trespass, death is reigning, how much more will those who receive, receive, not earn, not work for, but receive, God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life. 
through one man, Christ Jesus. In life, death is ready because of sin. But in life, Christians can reign when you receive two things. The gift of righteousness and the abundant provision of God's grace. Gift of righteousness actually is Jesus. He is our righteousness. Righteousness is a person. 1 Corinthians one thirty. Christ the righteousness. Through Christ we receive abundant grace. Romans 8.32 says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him for us, hold not along with the son, graciously give us all things. So through Christ we have so much of grace given to us, especially spiritual blessings. Faith, wisdom, word of God, hope, Holy Spirit, fellowship of God's people. Let me repeat that. What is coming to my heart? I am saying uh, faith, wisdom, word, spirit, fellowship of God's people, strength. They are all spiritual blessings. By receiving all these things which we can't earn, we receive. We only have to let the word of God go deep into us. In Colossians 3.16, it's written, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. I will teach much mother with all wisdom. You should allow God's word to go deep into heart. In other words, allowing a heart and mind to be uh, responding to God's word in whichever way God speaks to us. There are many Zoom meetings today all over the world. Many, so many speeches you can hear. Read your Bible yourself. You can attend your church, your fellowship. So many avenues are being built up in the faith. Because faith is built up by hearing the word. As you are taught the word of God, faith increases. And receive the word of God. And as we dwell upon whatever God speaks to us and don't let it go away, hear the word or read the word, written it, but persons, persons produce a crop. We persevere in spite of difficult circumstances. And you can be sure God will speak to us in difficult circumstances. Second Corinthians chapter 1, from verse 3, Paul writes, Pray to God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, the God of all comfort, who comforts in all our troubles, and we may comfort others in any trouble with the comfort received from God. The God of all comfort comforts us in all our troubles. In difficult times, present difficulties around us, when we listen to him, he will comfort us, encourage us, and build us up because he's a God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles. You can be sure when you go through difficult times, be it circumstances or maybe even your own sin, you can be sure God will speak. Sometimes people think, oh, God doesn't speak to me because I'm a sinner. We're all sinners. All the more he speaks to us when we sin because he will speak to us about our sin. My child, don't do this. When you're walking rightly with God, why should he speak to you? You're walking in his path, no? He may not, may not have to speak to you. In Isaiah, chapter 30, verse 21, the Lord says, you turn right or left, you'll hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way you walk in it. When you turn right, when you, when you go against God's ways, he'll bring you back. He will speak to us, surely. And his word is a lamp to my feet, light for a path. Psalm 119, verse 105. Not only when you sin against God, he speaks to us surely to listen to him. Also, when you go to difficult times, the God of all comfort wants to comfort us. And we have the comforter living inside us. When he speaks to us, please take to heart and the mind. Keep in mind what God is speaking in difficult circumstances. Don't keep in mind the symptoms of difficult circumstances. You look at the problem, what happens? It affects our faith. One of the opposites of faith is sight. Sight. Second Corinthians 5, 7, Paul writes, we live by faith, not by sight. Some people live by sight and look at circumstances, get discouraged, get upset. Whereas we live by faith in God's word, when God speaks to us, cherish it, hold on to it, thank God for it. And sometimes even though we don't listen to him, we don't 
have fellowship with the Holy Spirit, God is so faithful that he will come and speak to us through people and encourage us. Nothing like having your own fellowship with the Lord who lives inside us, who is an encourager, who will always encourage us. But sometimes we tend to neglect fellowship with the Lord personally because we are carried away by circumstances. Our mind is on earthly things, not on the word of God, not on what God speaks to us. Even then God is so faithful. Take for example David. From the time Samuel anointed him, it says in 1 Samuel 16, 13, as he anointed with him oil, from that day on, Spirit of God came upon David in power. From that day onwards, as a young, maybe a teenager, when Samuel anointed him, from that day onwards, Holy Spirit came upon him in power. So David had the potential to always listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit who is inside him. But then somebody did not. Did not. And at times he must have been discouraged by circumstances. From the time he was a teenager, he was announced by Samuel, till the age of 30, he was a fugitive, running away from Saul. King Saul, who was the king earlier, wanted to kill David. Till the age of 30, he was a fugitive in the wilderness. But God never let him down. God never discouraged him. God always encourages. He had the potential of being encouraged by the Lord through fellowship with the Holy Spirit. But apparently he was taken away by circumstances. There was one point of time, it says in 1 Samuel, 23rd chapter, 15 to 17. While David was at Horash in the desert of Sip, he learned that Saul had come to take his life. And Jonathan, son of Saul, went to David, help David find strength in the Lord. And Jonathan told David, don't be afraid. My father will not lay a hand upon you. You will be king over Israel. I will be second to you. Even my father knows this. Now, something Jonathan told David was a reminder of what God had told Samuel a long time back when he anointed David. He will be king over Israel. And many years later, when he was a fugitive, Carried away by circumstances, wondering what's going to happen to him. He must have been afraid. That's what John said, don't be afraid. Your father, my father, not lay a hand upon you. You'll be king of Israel. I'll be second to you. That never happened. Jonathan died. Even my father knows this. The father knew this till he wants to kill David. Can you imagine how silly, how foolish it must have been? But David was carried away by circumstances. And if you listen to the Holy Spirit voice, God had told him, You're going to be king. Don't get, don't worry. But Lord knew that he is not having fellowship at that point of time. So he sent Jonathan to him. Jonathan reminded him of the promise that came a long time ago. Big reminder about something God told him, help David find strength in God. When you have in mind the things of God, when you have in mind the word of God, be it an instruction, a promise, or a standard, we rise about difficulty. We reign in life, and this is entirely by grace. Being able to receive the word is grace. To understand the word is grace. To receive the Holy Spirit is by grace. Receiving wisdom is by grace. Receiving faith is by grace. Everything is by grace. Yet we go our own way sometimes. We all go through difficult times. Everybody goes through difficult times. But in those difficult times, we are called to be living by the teachings of Jesus. When that happens, we preserve the peace of the Lord. We so often I share this verse in the Bible. And the Lord told the apostles in John 16, 33, I've told you these things that in me you have peace. In the world you will have troubles, but take heart, I've overcome the world. Christian love does not mean we won't have troubles. We'll have troubles, but we reign over the troubles. But keeping in mind the things God has spoken to us or God has done to us. You can be sure he'll speak to us in difficult circumstances. Remind us of the relevant promise for us at that point of time. Take for example, Peter, who wrote to the churches in the region of Pontus, Galicia, Capricia, Asia and Bithynia. 1 Peter chapter 5, 8-10. to 
Eighth and ninth verse is the instruction to them. The tenth verse is what, what will happen when they go through trials and what God is going to do. Eight, nine, ten. Be self-controlled and alert. Renew the devil. Brother on the glowing line. Brother on the glowing line, looking for someone to devour. Resist him standing firm in the faith. Knowing your brother throughout the world and doing the same kind of suffering. You all go to suffering. But by faith in God's word, resist the devil. Keep in mind the things of God, not the things of this world, not even the devil, not even suffering. Tenth verse, and the God of all grace, who called the eternal glory in Christ Jesus, after suffer a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. So while going through trials, remember, keep in mind, these trials are training you to be one day strong, firm, and steadfast. A faith to be refined. In the same letter, in 1 Peter chapter 1, 6 and 7, Peter writes about how while living in this world, Christians will go to all kinds of trials. These have come that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine. I mean, result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So the purpose why we go to trials in the will of God. So our mind must be upon what's going to happen at the end of these trials. We're going to become mature and complete. James chapter 1, 2, 3, 4. Consider pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. For the testing of your faith, there is perseverance. First, he must finish his work in you. Let it be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Not lacking anything means what? Completeness, fullness, abundance. Abundant life doesn't happen overnight. It's the end part of a process. So while going through trials, we keep in mind what God is doing to us, in us, through those trials. That's why it requires faith. And Christian life is by faith. So in difficult circumstances, keep in mind what God is doing in you and through you. Present circumstance. Now, what about future? Many worry about possible future problems. And thinking about the future problem, we get anxious and our mind is uh, completely cuddled with all these thoughts. What could happen? What might happen? Now, most things we worry about never happen. Let me repeat that. Most things we worry about never happen. They're all in the mind. Instead of keeping an imaginary power in the mind, keep in mind his promise. He had the best plans for you. Jeremiah 29, 11. God says, For I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in the future. There are many Christians who imagine future circumstances to be very, very bad. And thinking about that today, they lose the peace of God and get anxious. I'm going to give a story from the Bible. Very often I share this before when I speak on anxiety, on losing peace. A story about uh, Jacob and Esau. Esau had, uh, was very angry with Jacob because Jacob had stolen his blessings. And uh, Esau was planning to kill his brother Jacob after the father Isaac dies. The mother comes to know about it, Rebecca. She tells uh, uh, Jacob, you go away to my brother Laban. You go away from here. Your brother Esau is contemplating trying to kill you. You go away. After your father dies, he wants to kill you. You go away. After your brother's anger subsides, I'll send for you when you come back. This is found in the book of Genesis, 27 chapter, 41 to 44. So Jacob goes away, run away from his brother, thinking his brother is going to kill me after my father dies. And awaiting uh, information from his dad, mother after Esau's anger subsides. So there he is in uh, his uncle Laban's place acquires wives and acquires a family and then uh, all children are born to him and uh, uh, he's there for 20 years. After 20 years, God speaks to Jacob. Go back to land of fathers and relatives. I will be with you. Genesis 31st chapter verse 3. You go back. And Jacob goes back. Without hearing from his mother that everything is okay, he's going back by faith. Praise God for Jacob. His mother told him, 
And as I was anger subsides, I'll send for you to come back. No, no news. But God says you go back. God never told Jacob that Ezra's anger subsided or not. Nothing about Ezra. You go. And he goes. Praise God, he goes trusting God. But while going back, being human, he is worried, concerned, what will happen? Mommy has not told me Ezra's anger subsided. Will Ezra kill me? He's a hunter. He's a man of the wilderness, man of the outdoors. I'm a domesticated person. All the worries. What do they do? He sends messengers to Ezov. He has acquired a lot of possessions. Men, servants, maid, servants, capital, donkeys, so many things. He sends messengers message to Ezov. Go and tell Ezov. I've got men, servants, maid, servants, capital, donkeys. Trying to uh, tell him, I'll give a gift to you. Trying to appease him, appeasing his anger. Messengers come back. In the book of Genesis, 32nd chapter, 6 and 7, they come back saying, Ezao is coming and 400 people are with him. 400 people. And verse 7 says, in great fear and distress, Jacob devised their possessions. Very distress, fear. Ezao is coming, 400 people. Why 400 people? What's he going to do to me? Mommy has not told me his anger, anger is upside But while going back, he's praying. Then he prays. Praise God, he prays. But after praying, he's still making plans. That's the thing many Christians know. When you pray, still worry. After praying, also they worry. He prays. And then again making plans. He makes he divides the group into four groups. And then preparing to meet uh, Ezra. And now he sends messengers to Ezra to say, I've got all these possessions. I can give something to you. I can give, give you something. He's trying to bribe him. But in his heart, heart has been pumping. Must have been having palpitations. What's going to happen? Will he kill me? Why 400 people are coming? As he comes near Ezao, book of Genesis, 30th chapter verse 4 says, Ezao comes running, hugs him and kisses him. What an anticlimax. All that worrying was a waste. All the anxiety was a waste. All the panning was a waste. What was good was he prayed. Two things he did good. He prayed. Before that, he went. Lord told him to go and he went. Then he prays. But after praying, make his own plans. Unnecessary. Then when Ezra he meets, Ezra comes and hugs him and kisses him. And then when he looks at this, Ezra responds. In verse 10, he tells Ezra, uh, Genesis 33rd chapter, verse 10, looking at you, is like looking at the face of God. Your face is like God's face. Can you imagine? He has never seen God. He was so thrilled about the fact that Ezra was completely changed that he is looking, it's like looking at God. What an anticlimax. God never told Jacob Ezra's anger subsided. I don't think even mother knew about it. Maybe as he came, God changed his heart. What do we learn from this? By going back to land his father's relatives, because God told him he was pleasing God. He could have told God, Lord, according to uh, my mama, mommy, that when the anger, as those anger subsides, I can go back. Nothing has come, so should I go back? He didn't ask any questions. He just went, obeyed God. He also prayed. What do we learn from that? Proverbs 16, 7. When a man's ways are pleasing to God, he makes even his enemies live at peace. We should be concerned about pleasing God. That's all. Having in mind the Lord's instructions, the Lord's promises, His standard, that's all. His standard for us is not to be anxious. That's God's plan for us. Don't be anxious. And being, becoming anxious is actually disobedience to God. So we should be concerned about walking in the ways of God. Don't worry about the future. What is always about the future only? We are so blessed today. We have 7,000 and promised the Bible. 7487 promises available for us. How much did Jacob know? I don't know how much he knew. But he obeyed God. We are so blessed today. We have so much of word in this given to us. All the promises are for us. How much more we should rise above every difficulty and have in mind the promise of God. And just one promise in the Bible is sufficient for us never to be anxious. So don't keep in mind what could happen in the future, what might happen. What will happen to my children? I will go away. Who will take care of my children? Who will take care? God will take care. He gave them to you. 
as long as you are alive he will use you to take care of them if you are gone god will use to somebody else he is he is everybody's world in god's hands we may concern about having in mind the things of god so in that context a mind must be preoccupied in doing the will of god what does jesus mind always concerned about in john 4:34 he told the disciples my food is do the will of him who sent me and finish his work that's my food that's my sustenance breakfast lunch dinner word 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 what god speaks to me i must keep in mind the things of god always remember him and never get discouraged because when we get discouraged only when we look at circumstances the psalmist says in psalm 42 verse 5 psalm 42 verse 5 Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why is so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God. For I praise you, my Savior, my God. My soul is downcast within me. What is soul? Soul is emotions, intellect, and the will, the mind. The mind is part of the soul. Soul are three three uh, entities: emotions, intellect, and the will. Intellect to do the mind. Soul is downcast. Why? Looking at circumstances. Then he says. Therefore, I will remember you. I will remember his future tense, not present tense. If you always remember God, you won't get discouraged. Who he is to you, who you are to him. Never forget that. So sometimes a mind gets carried away by possible difficulties in the future. Let the mind not be upon that. It be on God's word. You rise. Your, your mind will be above your circumstances. present circumstances and possible future circumstances the third area which i briefly touch upon is our mind is based on uh, is dwelling upon what people say people's opinion about you their criticism their gossip their malice their slander and we dwell upon those things and the mind gets totally polluted is no more a sound mind it's a disturbed mind is a troubled mind god does want us to have that mind he wants us to have in mind who he is to us who we are to him don't be too much preoccupied about what people think about you we are not called to be people pleasers we are called to be god pleasers in first thessalonians 2:4 paul writes we are not trying to please men but god who tests our hearts how many christians their minds are troubled downcast discouraged because they keep the mind on what people say about them negative things about them some of it may be true in which case you commit that to god say lord change me lord but many times it is false allegations when they make false allegations don't focus on the allegation how to respond to false allegations people make about you it happens in the churches also matthew chapter 5 11 and 12 the lord says Matthew chapter five eleven. After talking about the beatitudes, here he tells them, "Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you. Rejoice and be glad, for get the reward in heaven. For this is the way they they persecute the prophets who are before you. So don't go by what people say, but always be concerned about what God thinks about you and what He says about you." Every one of us is precious to God. We are His delight. We are delight because we belong to Him. We are purchased by His blood. Zephaniah three seventeen, the Lord is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with His love. He will rejoice over you singing. God sings over us with joyful songs. Not lamentations, joyful songs, because we are precious to Him. Been bought by His blood. Instead of focusing on what people say about you, or think about you, or talk about you, why not we focus on what God says about us, who we are to Him? Every one of us pleasing to God because of who we are, who we are made to be. We are the delight of God. Not only that, God delights to do good to us. He loves to do good to us. Don't have to tell God, Lord, please be nice to me, Lord. Be loving, Lord. His love personified. Be merciful, Lord. His mercy personified. Be kind, Lord. His kindness personified. 
why we ask God to be kind? He is kindness. He is love. And in Jeremiah, 32nd chapter, 38 to 41, read about how God never stopped doing good to us. He will rejoice in doing good to us. He rejoices in doing good to us. He delights in who we are, delights to do good to us, and he delights to teach us mysteries, to teach us. In Luke chapter 10, we read in verse 21, after the 70 elders came back rejoicing because demons summoned them in the name of Jesus, the Lord looks to the Father and says, it says in that particular verse, at that time, Jesus, full of joy to the Holy Spirit, tells the Father, I thank you, Father, God of heaven and earth, the hidden this thing by the learned, revealed to children. For this was your good pleasure. God finds pleasure in revealing mysteries to children, people who are like children, teachable, humble, moldable, contrite people. And therefore, look at yourself in the godly perspective. Yes, when people say some things about you, weigh what they say. Is it true of me? Something negative they're saying is it true? If it's true, Lord, do change me, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I got a revelation of my weaknesses. You are a God who changes my weakness into strength, so change it, Lord. If it's a false delegation, ignore it. But always remember who you are to God and who God is to you. Never forget that. Because then he'll make you rise above every circumstance. Have in mind the things of God. And sometimes tell God, Lord, uh, I think I shared once in the group also, uh, about a few months back, I told God, I tell this to God, I don't tell it normally to people. I, I told God, Lord, tell me something good about me, something nice about me, you tell me. And then my personal prayer I told him. And God took me very seriously. He took me seriously. You know what he told me? Isaiah 43, 4. You are precious and honored in my sight and I love you. You are precious to me, honored in my sight and I love you. I'm not worthy of that honor. I'm not worthy of his uh, love. I'm not worthy of being precious to him. But he says that. I never forget that verse. It's all for all of you too. No, don't think it's only for me. I specifically asked God and he told me, that is for everybody purchased by the blood of Christ. So instead of thinking about people think about you, remember who you are to God. The delight of God. The apple of God's eye. Imagine uh, a young lady Someone tells the young lady, oh, you look like a famous film star. More than a film star, you look better than a film star. And uh, when the, such a compliment is given to a lady, of, even for men, whatever, some other compliment is given, you won't forget the compliment, you won't forget the person who made the compliment. You won't forget the compliment, unique compliment. You won't forget the person who made the compliment. When God says with apple of his eye, why do you forget that? What a compliment God is giving us. He has delight. He esteems those who love his word, who tremble at his word. Apple of God's eye we are. The crown of splendor in God's hand. Crown of splendor in God's hand. A royal diadem in the hand of God. Isaiah 6 to 3. So keep in mind these things. Every morning when I pray, I, I, most of my prayer time is enjoying God. It's not so much uh, praying for myself. I pray for other people. A lot of people I pray nowadays since I have a lot of time. And I enjoy God primarily. While enjoying God, I remind myself who I am to God and who He is to me. I normally begin by saying, Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus. Lord, I report to you. I'm checking in. I tell Jesus that I'm checking in. I'm checking in. I'm reporting to you. And for you to enjoy me, for me to enjoy you. And most of my fellowship time is enjoying God. Reminding myself who I am to God who he, he is to me. And then when you come out of the prayer time, the whole world looks so beautiful. Everybody in the world is so nice. They may say many things, but you don't mind it. I pray for a lot of people who are against me now. I, I don't have anything against anybody now. For many years, I have not had any, any, any iota of bitterness. Simply because uh, when God has forgiven me, I have no right not to forgive anybody. And when you forgive, we have to forget. I don't even remember these people. What they did also. I choose to forget. But instead of repressing, instead of thinking about those things they did, think of who you are to God, who God is to you. When a mind is full of those things, you rise above the talk of people, negative talk of people. You don't mind what they, what they talk. Because it reflects on them, not on you. 
when they write with God. Very often people talk about a past sins, isn't it? It happens. And uh, as far as you are concerned, when you repented and put it behind and move on, don't think about the past. Isaiah 43, 18, 19. Forget the former things. Don't dwell in the past. I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do not perceive it. I am making way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. Forget your past sins because God chooses to forget. You got a very good memory, God. <laughs> no doubt. He chooses not to remember. That's it. Jeremiah 31, 34. I'll forget the sins and remember the sins no more. So when God has forgiven us our sins, why do you want to remember? Are you more righteous than God? If you're not repented, then you must repent. If you repented and put it behind, don't go back to that old memories of sin. It not, will not bless you. Keep in mind God's will for you today. That's your food, your sustenance, breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks, everything. And keep in mind, if God speaks about the future, keep in mind that past forget completely. Everybody has a past, present and a future. Past we forget. Future don't worry. Present every day live for Jesus. Early morning get up. Whatever time you choose, I'm not going to dictate you which time you should get up. And spend time with God. Ask Him the agenda for the day. He specifically will say, put in your heart what He wants you to do. And then ask Him wisdom and strength to do it. So all the blessings of the spiritual realm have been given to us today. Ephesians 1 3 says, His blesses in the spiritual realms, in the heavenly realms, with every spiritual blessing in Christ. I mentioned some of them faith. Wisdom, strength, hope, love for us to live for Him, especially wisdom and strength. Wisdom to know His will, strength to do His will, and keeping in mind the things of God. Now, when the other things come and clutter your mind, then remember you were given a spiritual weapon over every thought. 2 Corinthians 10 5. We take captive every thought and make it open to Jesus. Rebook the thought, negative thought that comes to you, and then replace the thought with the godly thoughts from God's word, which the Holy Spirit will give you. He will give, give to you. He will remind you. He put his word in your heart, in your mind also. And also, we must be people who train ourselves to be godly, training to be godly. Now, normally, when you pray and when you read the Bible, you have noticed your mind goes here and there. Again, God gives us resources to bring the mind back, right track. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7, Peter writes, Be clear-minded and self-controlled that you can pray. Clear-minded, self-control, sound-minded. Sound mind, Holy Spirit gives us. So our mind is very, very important for God. We have to be transformed by renewing of our minds. So thinking about things of God will make us rise about difficult circumstances, present, future or even uh, un unwanted talk of people, ignore it. Enjoy God. Remember, He's waiting for us to go to heaven. We've got work to do here. Be busy doing His will. Let His will be your food. Praise God. I'm going to pray for all of you that our mind will be renewed by the Spirit and not get sidetracked from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for every one of us, Zoom Lord. Thank you, Master. Let not our minds be distracted from pure and sincere devotion to Christ. Help us walk with you, Lord. And I pray that we'll be careful of what we think, Lord. Our thinking is very important to you, Lord. We examine our thoughts, Lord. And therefore, I pray for each one of us. We are transformed by our power, by the renewing of our minds, Lord. We'll hear the word, written it, with perseverance, produce crop, 30, 60, 100, 4. Pray for every one of us, Lord. We'll receive every resource you have for us, Lord. Give us more and more wisdom more and more strength, more and more faith, more and more word, more and more spirit, and help us enjoy not only fellowship with you, Lord, also fellowship with godly people, Lord. Come to all of us in your hands, Lord. In Jesus' precious and master's name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all.